Good morning. Welcome to another edition of Badass Marketing. Once again, I am joined by the ever so lovely <laughs> Angela Dunn. Angela, how are you? I'm great. Hello, everybody. And hang so, on to your hats. This is going to be a great discussion. So this is what, our 303rd episode? Is that oh, about stop right? it. We're <laughs> at like 15. Yeah, just feels like more. So what are we talking about today? <laughs> we are talking about content. You know, and whether you believe that content is king or queen or it's one of the serfs, um, I hope we change your mind by the end of this episode. Which direction are we going? We're going towards kings and queens. Okay. Content is king. Oh, my God. So <clears throat> where do we begin? There's so much to talk about here. I, I and... know it. It's a it's a wide open subject worthy of several different podcasts. But I wanted to open this can of worms. And I think I think the best place to start, Mike, really is why. Why would you take the time and the effort to commit yourself to content because it is the long game yeah so you know when we work with our clients there's a lot of noise on the internet and content is clearly a contributor to lots of noise on the internet and you know if you haven't lost your mind and begun to freak out over generative ai just add that to the mix right <laughs> so like you know there if you read most articles around content um you know, most will suggest that AI is going to replace content writers. AI is going to replace marketing. Um, you know, I've mentioned in recent uh, podcasts that, you know, AI is clearly, at least in my opinion, this is one I do agree with, um, going to change what search looks like. And, you know, we have seen how the Google homepage and search page is changing through the use of their generative AI and it's taking up lots of landscape. So based on all that, we should just give up, right? We should just throw in the towel, let Google do what they do. Um, or we can revisit content and understand the value of content. So, and to focus your effort instead of, you know, the whole spraying content everywhere onto every platform willy-nilly, how can you do it strategically and effectively? Yeah, but I'm going to back up a, a, a second and sort of talk about where is the opportunity to differentiate with content, okay? And where I think that we can differentiate, and to the best of my knowledge, generative AI is not here that yet um, or has not gotten to this place yet, but we as humans can be sympathetic. We can be empathetic. We can understand emotions. And for most of our sales, you know, it's about tapping into an emotion, right? Does this product yes. make you feel safe? Does this product make you feel successful? Does this product make you feel rich, right? These emotions. And while I think that AI can very clearly sort of spit out generic content, it's going to have a really hard time touching those emotions and writing to those emotions efficiently. And what we know is people buy in the market based on emotions, right? Yes. I don't, you know, theoretically, I would buy a car because it's a reasonable mode of transportation and it gets me from point A to point B. But when we look at the car purchase, there's so much more wrapped into <laughs> purchasing a vehicle. This is your identity, right? Like, do you want to be known as you know a, a beamer do you want to be known as you it's know sporty. sports utility you know you know are you flashy red are you white are you gray you know like all these factors are, are you know a reflection of how you want to feel as a result of your car right so when we write content around that we're looking like we understand that yes your car serves a function and that's to get you from point A to B. But we also understand that the, your, con, your car or your vehicle is an extension of your personal brand. This is how I want to present myself. And thus, these are the emotions I want. You know, and if you have a family and maybe, you know, safety and those issues 
are of great concern. I want to protect my family. So when we create content, the place that we have a key op opportunity to differentiate is we can write about emotions. We can tap into the emotions of our clients or our prospects much better than I think AI ever will. Yes, for oh, truer words were never spoken, Mike. I mean, I just had a huge epiphany yesterday. You know, I've been telling people forever, what is the goal of LinkedIn? The goal of LinkedIn is to connect the right people for the right opportunities. That's what it was designed for. What is the goal of a connection? The goal of a connection is to create relationship because without relationship, there isn't anything. What is the goal of a post? It's to make somebody feel something and take a step of action. And, and, and you know that I'm a big fan of the five whys. Yes. Okay. And I would have suggested that you haven't exhausted the five whys. Because, you know, you said that LinkedIn is about creating the relationship. But there's an underlying, like, there's a lot of places that I can create a relationship. Right, and but this I is a specific relationships on LinkedIn for another underlying reason, right? I'm trying and to grow you post business. for another underlying reason, right? So I, you know, will post on LinkedIn because I see this as an opportunity to grow my business. I see this as an opportunity to increase revenues. You know, so it's more than the you know. I will use the relationships and develop relationships to facilitate that goal. But my goal on LinkedIn is typically business development and, you know, growing my business. But, you know, so I would, you know, if I weren't doing that, I'm not sure that I would be on LinkedIn. If I weren't out trying to grow my business, you know, why would I actively be on LinkedIn? It's a B2B platform. That's right. the reason to be there. And, and again, it's about finding that what make sure we understand the underlying reason that you're on these platforms. Right. right. I'm not on LinkedIn to make friends. <laughs> you know, <what> I mean? <laughs> if it happens, that's fine. And, you know, and I understand that making friends is part of that process, but that's not the agenda. That right. I have, right. Um, so it's important. Also, I don't know when generating content, if, Generative AI would make that kind of distinction, right? And it this will is sort the of tricky spit out piece. something that you know. Yes. If you ask it a basic question, it'll spit out a basic answer. And right. what it doesn't have the ability to do is to check itself, which you know. So we just had a discussion about LinkedIn, and I'm like, oh, you know, yes, it's about relationship, but, and we sort of further defined why we are doing that. Whereas if we just had relied on AI to, pr to produce that content, they would have stopped at the relationship. Right? right. Because AI doesn't at presently have the ability to like check its own work and like, you know, that conclusion, maybe it's not fully formed. Right. So one of the thing about content is it is still a place to differentiate. It's a place to clarify our messaging. Right. So that, there is lots of noise on the internet, but if you can resonate and you can connect with your prospects on an emotional level, then, you know, the sales are easy. Like, if, you know, if I can, if you're trying to feel good and I can make you feel good, and as long as you're willing, you know, it's reasonable value that you're willing to pay for, we have a connection, right? I have something that you want. You want to feel good. I have something that can make you feel good. So, you know, we have that ability to tap into those emotions. Whereas I think with AI, it's going to maybe it'll run through, you know, the process, you know, the product features, maybe it'll run through some basic benefits, but it's not going to tap, tap into emotions. And I think that's a really clear place to differentiate in your content um, is right. to have that ability to bring the human back in to the discussion and into the, you know, the relationship. Yes. Well, and I think another important distinction there is if you're generating content off of ChatGPT or any other form of AI, is that it's really more of a conversation of one to many. It's not a one to one conversation. 
it's not a personal conversation. And I always tell my clients when I'm working on strategy, you really want to think about who that is that is reading it. If it's your ideal client, it's a one-to-one conversation as if you were having coffee at a coffee shop and you're talking to a single person. And that's where that generic piece comes in. It's not generic if you're speaking one-to-one. Right. It has to be personalized. And, ha- and the the importance of a conversation and a relationship is actually listening to the other party to understand what their unmet needs are. Right. So one of the challenges that we always have in marketing is that we develop a product and then we go out and we try to push it to everybody. Right. <laughs> like, you know, I've created this really killer product. Do you want it? And the answer is like, mm, no, I don't because I'm, I'm not looking for that. Whereas if we actually go out to the market and we're like, hey, what's going on? What are you struggling with? What can we help you with? And they, your clients or your prospects give you these insights, then we're like, oh, you know, I know a way to, that we can address that. And we'll create a solution for you around your product and your problem so that, you know, this personalized, customized solution um, versus trying to sell you something off the shelf. And to convey some of that messaging, we're going to rely on content. Right. You know, we will talk to folks, whether and maybe build um, the personas to understand, like, what are their needs? And then based on their needs and based on how they look for what they're looking for, it's important to understand the language that the prospect is using. We will develop content using their language for the problem that they have. Right. Right. So that, you know, when they read it, they will self-identify like, oh, that's me. (laughs) They can make my life better. And then they'll, you know, obviously, hopefully the the idea is that they'll contact us or we can, you know, engage them because what we're talking about is resonating with the problem that they're having. Yes. Yes. So there is a certain amount of research and interaction with this whole content idea. We're not just pushing content out without feedback or without some market research. I mean, you know, what we have to understand is there's different types of contents that are serving different types of objectives, right? So I may push content because I am looking to, you know, rank with a certain keyword. So I'm going to push content around that keyword. Hopefully it's still relevant and hopefully it's still connecting. But, you know, the objective there is I want to create visibility around a keyword or or a problem. So I'm going to create content around that, which may be a different format or may sound different than when I'm engaging someone directly. Or if I'm, you know, like when I'm emailing someone and I know or I am seeking to understand what their, their, you know, unmet needs are. So we do use different types of content. Um, Not all of it is going to be personalized. Not all of it is going to be customized. Um, So, you know, also understanding with content and your content strategy is what's your objective with this particular piece of content? Is it creating visibility? Is it creating likes? Is it, you know, is it creating followers? Um, Is there a call to action? Am I trying to move them onto a newsletter? Understanding what the underlying reason of creating this specific piece of content at this point in time is because your messaging and and your content may differ depending on what the outcome is if i just want to create likes i'm going to send something you know i mean i can send a happy dog and you know that people will like it and you know it creates (laughs) that doesn't necessarily drive traffic well it depends on what my objective was if my objective was i want to you know i want to get followers and i want to get likes Um, you know, and I'm not concerned where they come from. I just want volume. Then, you know, I'm going to post, you know, the meme of the day, the meme of the day, the dog, happy dog, the kitten rescue, whatever it needs to be, if that's my sole goal. Okay. But that would be a different goal than if I'm trying to connect with a digital health client that is struggling with how to integrate generative AI. That's a wholly, you know, a completely different topic and and a different approach to content. And a different emotion altogether. Right. They're looking to solve a business problem versus they're versus scrolling the internet and want to feel good or being you know, entertained. Being <laughs> entertained. Right. Exactly. <laughs> That's a form of content, but it's a different it has a different objective. So it's 
part of this is understanding what was your underlying objective in creating this content. And I can tell you that a lot of people create content without considering whether or not they have an underlying objective. Like, it, they, yes, oh, and I have told clients this produce content, just produce content. For God's sake, produce content. And they do. <laughs> and then once we get in producing content, then we start to refine it and like, okay, now that we have you in the mindset of producing content, let's sort of direct this a little bit better so that we have a greater impact or we're reaching a specific target audience, you know. Um, but in the beginning, we're just trying to get them used to producing content um, and creating activity. Yes. So let's back all the way up to the beginning. And okay. let's say that somebody comes to you and they want to start producing content and they have a somewhat fleshed out objective. Um, what's the first step? Um, so, I mean, the first step is understanding, you know, what are you trying to achieve? You know, are you looking to, you know, are you looking to get people to sign up for a newsletter? Are you getting, trying to get people to call your office so that you can begin, you know, direct marketing to them? Um, what is your primary objective? So, you know, we want to know, like, why are we creating this content? Because there's a lot of reasons to create content and we want to make sure we understand what your outcome is. We want to start with the outcome that you, the desired outcome, and then we'll back into how to get there. So let's just say for um, the sake of argument that this person has shifted just a tiny bit in their business and they're really trying to create awareness of this shift and more visibility. Yeah, so I mean, if they're trying to create awareness, but I want to understand, it, well, and again, I'm going to say to who, so who is their target audience? Exactly. And then if they're trying to create awareness, I want to understand what is the language that their target audience is using around this topic? And one of the best ways to do that is to go to Google, type in your subject matter, and Google will tell you the top five inquiries around that topic. So you can see what people are asking Google, which is a you know a huge data analytics tool um, around this topic. And we can start to see the words that they're using. We can start to see how they're phrasing it because most people who are talking about tech may not know the specifics of the technology or the correct, you know, usage, but they'll like, you know, give me information about cheap solar panels. You know I mean? There's a whole range of solar panels as a whole, you know, but before we get to that kind of depth, we want to understand what are they looking for? Right. 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 So, um, if they're starting out and they don't have a huge bank of content, how often and where do you recommend that they get their content out there? Um, so how often is one of those questions of it, it's going to depend on the platform. Um, and, and then the platform itself is, you know, is this a direct to consumer play? Is this a B2B play? Um, you know, is this entertainment? So, you know, if you are looking to promote music or something like that, then you want to have your music on podcast, you want to have it on um, Spotify, you want to have it on YouTube, you know, so that people can play that, uh, which is a very different audience and market, you know, platform than if it's a B2B play and I'm selling to businesses where I'm going to be on LinkedIn. Um, for the most part, LinkedIn is going to be B2B. Um, Facebook has a tendency to run towards the consumer side. Um, YouTube, depending on the nature of what it is that you're promoting, um, is either entertainment or information. And it's those, it'll serve different purposes. Um, you know, we use Twitter, we use other platforms. Um, but if you're trying to reach other businesses, then our primary focus would be on LinkedIn. Right. So it really depends on that whole buyer persona and where they're showing up the most as well. Yeah. I mean, understanding where are they looking for information? Is this a Google search? Are they reaching out to other folks? You know, is this a word of mouth type of referral where you should be networking and not even wasting your time on LinkedIn? It's really a question of, you know, where do they get their information as it relates to the buying decision that they're about to make. And both of us work 
pretty heavily in the B2B space. Um, so LinkedIn is going to be a fairly frequent use for that, but also the website. So do you want to talk a little bit about um, posting content to your website? Because that's that's your space. Yeah, I mean, again, for us, it, it's going to come down to what is the objective. And, you know, I realize that I have a tendency to recycle themes, um, which I'm about to do. <laughs> but the idea is, while we think LinkedIn is a great tool, we also don't want to be solely reliant on it. Because we know that at any given point in time, for whatever reason, we might get bounced or we might lose contacts. And the reality is, if I can't access LinkedIn, I can't contact those people because all my contact information remains in LinkedIn. So for most of our activities, what we are trying to do is to move people off the platforms to sign up directly for either an email or an SMS or some kind of messaging system where we can touch them directly. We will continue to put content out on those platforms such as LinkedIn, but our objective is typically to move them off those platforms so that in the event that we platforms come and go, we, we've joked about Clubhouse and all that kind of stuff, but in the event that the platform either is no longer popular or that you get lost in the noise because we know that on a lot of the platforms because there's just so much content being pushed through LinkedIn, pushed through Facebook, that the reach is very limited to our audience. So we right. need to be able to find ways to cut through that noise. And you know, one of the ways that we hope to try to cut through that noise is to move people from these very noisy platforms, and LinkedIn is one of them, to you know, giving us their new their email for a newsletter or giving us their phone number so that we can do text mess messaging. Obviously, all of this is permission based and opt in, um, but our goal for the most part is trying to be able to touch people directly so that right. in the event, you know, people do read their emails. They don't always reply to them, but most folks will read their emails and go through their box. Um, and, or alternatively, most people will read their text. Um, you know, I default, personally, I default their text and I tend to do a lot yes. of this either, either via texting or WhatsApp. Um, but I also get spam there too. So I'm aware that, you know, I still have to filter out some of the noise. And then the question with content is, how do you make it appear in the place that it needs to appear at the time that it needs to appear, you know, the right time, the right place um, at the right moment. Those, yeah. And know, that timing really, thing, yeah, that is really tricky because if you have global clients or clients on the East coast and that sort of thing, it's, wow. Yeah. The timing gets very tricky. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we have, been doing this a long time and like you know is it tuesday afternoon is it sunday morning like, <laughs> like what is the best time and the only thing that you can do there is you know do some a b testing see how people respond see where right um you know try it one week on a tuesday try it one week on a wednesday see if there's any material difference um that really just comes down to a b testing for the most part um but again getting the right content in front of the right person at the right time that's like the holy grail um, and very elusive. And, you know, I'm going to tell you that when I changed my newsletter from Tuesday to Thursday, it increased my um, views and open rate for the newsletter by a factor of three. And, Tuesday and has must that, be has when... that maintained? Yes. That's interesting. I think a lot everybody of times, sends theirs on Tuesdays and Thursday yeah. is not a common day. Yeah, it's always interesting because whenever you change some sort of marketing tactic, you will always almost inevitably get a little bit of a bump because it's just new. So people you know, will respond. Um, but whether or not that's sustainable, as it is in your case, is really what ends up being important. Um, yeah, it's been a year now. Okay. It's so clearly you've had a year to look at it and say, you know, this was a sustainable increase versus a, a blip when I changed the, you know, the day. Yeah. And really it, it was just too hard for me to get it out on a Monday night. <laughs> right. it's just Monday is putting out fires day. <laughs> but it also, you know, it also depends on, you know, cause we have consumer clients. So 
for us, a lot of times we, we will do Thursday sometimes and maybe Friday, depending on like if they're in, we're trying to tap into that weekend mode, right? Because if I send something on Wednesday, it's too early and they kind of ignore it because they're not ready to go into weekend mode. But if they're, you know, if I send it Friday afternoon and they've already mentally checked out, um, they might be more receptive to the content as it relates to a consumer product. Um, right. Things like that. So again, it's one of those things you need to test it, try it, try different, you know, alternatives, A-B test it, and then, you know, you'll figure out what works best for you. Um, the other thing with regard to that is, have you changed the the voice of your newsletter? I don't think I've changed it at all. Okay. It's, it's. Because yeah. sometimes it, it's a question of, you know, you know, for us, when we're working with different clients, it's figuring out what the right voice is. Do they want formal? Do they want casual? Do they want funny? Um, you know, what connects with their audience? Um, right. you know, if we're if we're doing a piece that's very technologically, you know, challenging, funny probably doesn't isn't appropriate. You know, unless it breaks the, the tension of the fact that it's so hard to understand. Right? Yeah. And you know, you know, I think I think authenticity is really one of the keys here, you know, especially for a newsletter, a newsletter is just a, you know, it depends on the purpose of your newsletter. Also, if your newsletter is really just to inform, then you can have a more formal tone. But if you are the person that is providing the services and what you're trying to establish is trust, then letting some of your personality come out and letting people really get to know you a little bit helps that whole know, like, and trust process. And, and that also comes back to, you know, what are you selling, right? Because yes. if you're a service provider, then you're selling yourself. So you you are selling, you know, we're reliable, we're trusty, this type of thing, which is different than if you are selling, uh, you know, a technology solution where people are like, what is the memory? What is the bandwidth what is the you know the RAM memory you know where people are looking for very specifics because they're you know they're comparing it to something else so it's really going to be you know, again customized based on you know what you're selling and who your audience is right right so when we're looking at a a content sort of strategy for folks the first thing is understanding some of the underlying key points, like what are they trying to accomplish? Well, we're trying to increase sales, okay? And then what we're trying to understand is, all right, who's your target audience? Um, what specifically are their unmet needs so that we can speak to those unmet needs? And we will do that through creating buyer personas and understanding, you know, you have three types of customers. This customer is focused on value. This customer is focused on quantity or quality those types of things and understanding what it is that resonates with those particular personas, right? And then understanding, further understanding, where are they? You know, are they, is this a LinkedIn audience? Is this a Facebook audience? You know, do we reach them on TikTok? How old are they? Where are they? Um, you know, so it's really about understanding the audience, their needs and how and where they look for things. Um, if they are typically, if we're selling them a, a service by our service provider, that may be word of mouth. And we, we would say, you know what, don't advertise, join a networking group or, you know, do this type of networking activity because these people are going to turn to their accountant or their lawyer for this referral, right? And you want to be in front of, you know, those referral partners that are tapping into the audience that you want to be part of. So well, and and then there is a question of if most of your business comes to you from referrals, your content strategy might be to stay top of mind with your referral partners. Sure, of course. And then, and how do you do that? Do you provide content for them that meets their needs? Are you networking with them? You know, and it's really going to be a function of who are those referral partners and what do you need to, you know, create this trust and this referral opportunity um, because they feel that you're the right resource to recommend to their clients because that recommendation you know is on them if it's a good recommendation they you know kudos if it's a bad recommendation like really you sent me over there that guy was <laughs> we've had <Yeah>. them 
Well, I'm I'm a big fan of staying top of mind with your referral partners. I mean, one of the clients I signed on yesterday, seriously, was my name came up at a networking event because I knew several of the people that were in that networking event. And he reached out to me through LinkedIn and we're working together. Yeah, I mean, because we have, you know, we look at our referral partners the same way we look at influence marketers. Right. It's they have a built in audience, whether it be their client base, whether it be, um, you know, whatever they have, whether they have an established newsletter or something like that. So we look at the referral partners like they're influencers. So we want to understand what can we provide to the influencer, whether it be, you know, a referral partner or a social media influencer that will benefit them because they're, they're they need a reason to do it other than being nice to us, because that's not a good enough reason um, that will benefit them. And at the same time, reach the audience that we want to reach with whatever messaging we're trying to, you know, convey. Yes. And so collaboration on some of these things is, is an important consideration. And not every collaboration is going to have the same results. Um, yeah, I mean, I think collaboration, I would agree with you, but it might be a little tough, right? Because collaboration suggests that they're doing work on their end, they may not want to, right? Especially with our referral partners, we need to give to them because they're giving back to us in the form of referrals. We don't want to give right. to them like, here you go, do some more work because they won't. That's just not well, the nature of the relationship. Yeah, and I think that I'm really talking about simple collaborations, like featuring somebody in your newsletter, you know, and you've done that for me, I've done that yeah. for you. Yeah. Um, and I have a friend that just did that recently that, and it worked out really well. She did a fantastic interview and it had amazing results. So, you know, if but she you was, find- She was an influencer. I'm assuming she has a built-in audience. Yes, right? yes. So this referral she's partner, an, for all practical purposes, is an influencer. Yes, and she's in adjacent space. So it's easy for people to say, oh, well, she does this and she does that. And it's very similar, but it's in super different spaces. I mean, one of the typical questions we will ask a client when they're onboarding is who are those influencers? Who are the people that influence the buying decision? Sometimes it's a parent that influences a child's buying decision and we have to speak to the parent. Sometimes if it's a health concern, it's a doctor or a nurse. Um, more often it's the nurse because the doctors don't spend a lot of time with them, but the nurse engages them throughout the care cycle. So you know, a lot of times we will target our content towards the nurses because it helps them and it then further reaches our target audience. So understanding who the influencer is in the situation where like who helps your prospect in the buying decision, right? Who do they turn to? Right. Because we, we know, and this is a pretty accepted statistic, that 85% of purchases begin with um, somebody asking for a referral. Yes. Right. And, and so that referral and the magic is, is who are they asking? Because that's who we want to be. I don't want to be like one of the things for me is I don't want to have to market one to one. Like I don't want to have to find every consumer and try to sell them what we're trying to sell, whatever it is we're trying to sell. What I would like to do is I would like to find the influencer that touches a hundred of those people, sell them and convince them that this is what you know a good solution. And then they will in turn push it out to their network. So, you know, for us, when it comes to messaging, we're looking to find those influencers because we understand the leverage that they have and we want to tap into that leverage. Right, right. And that makes it so much easier. Things are so much more warmed up by the time they get to you. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's the difference between a warm lead and a, you know, cold call. Because you know, yes. if I call somebody out of the blue and like, hey, do you want to buy our services? And they're like, yeah, we don't know you. Who are you? Right. But if I get an introduction from a trusted resource, they're like, oh, okay. If, you know, if Sam sent me, it must be, you know, he must be a good guy because I know Sam and Sam is, is you know, a reliable partner to me. Therefore, his referral is probably a good source. So that just, you know, turns it from cold to warm almost immediately. Right. Right. 
So the whole idea of creating content for referral partners, that's an interesting concept, but that would seem to be where the efficiency would be. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I want to say we're not necessarily creating it for the influencer, but what we're creating is content that we can share with the influencer that helps them make the referral, right? So either it's a valuable resource that they can then turn around and give to their clients or something like that. Um, but, you know, what is it that we can give them that helps them keep us type of, top of mind, which we indicated is very important, you know, is a legitimate solution for the problems that the people they work with are seeking, right? Because, every, you know, everybody loves to go to, you know, that referral partner or whoever it is and say, hey, you know, have you worked with somebody or do you know somebody, right? I can Google it and I can get a whole bunch of people that I, that, you know, I don't know at all. And, you know, I don't know, you know, we can look at their Google, you know, um, likes and unlikes and try to read through all that, but, you know, it's self-posted. We don't know if it's real, you know, but if I have someone that I can call and say, Hey, who did you use? And they're like, Oh, I use this person. They were great. Um, that's just kind of, you know, that's a huge warm introduction. We love that. Yes. And especially in marketing, I mean, I don't know about you, but I hear not such great stories all the time about, yeah, I spent, you know, $20,000 on this and it didn't work. <laughs> and in marketing, <laughs> I, you know, it, it, it happens all the time, you know, somebody. Yeah, but I'm going to argue the reason why it didn't work is you didn't measure it because you shouldn't have spent $20,000 to figure out it didn't work. You should have had some, you should have had some insights much earlier than that. Um, so, you know, one of the things, and, and, you know, this comes up a lot is the fact that you need to have a set of metrics. You need to have a set of KPIs around your objective so that we can measure whether or not it's effective, whether it's ROI, whether it's likes, whether it's conversions, signups, whatever it is, there's got to be some kind of metric because we don't want to spend $20,000 and find out, oh, it didn't work. Right. That's a lot of money. Um, you know, what we want to do is to start off small, test it. Um, we might make some assumptions and we'll test that theory by doing smaller campaigns and see what resonates so that before we spend $20,000, maybe we spend 500, maybe we spend a thousand and try to flush out some of the messaging um, to see how people respond to it. So, you know, I, I would say the biggest challenge with content marketing as far as efficacy is establishing the baseline of what are the metrics that you need to determine whether or not there's an ROI, to determine whether or not, you know, your KPIs are working. Right, right. And I think this is where it gets really sticky for a lot of people because they don't know what to measure. You know, they'll come to somebody to create content for them and they'll say, this is what we want without really thinking through how to measure it, how it's going to be received. Um, I saw a joke on LinkedIn the other day, you know, behind every failed piece of content, there was an executive that wanted it. Yeah, and, I, I mean, a lot of that is the objective of what the, the underlying why of, the, of why they were creating that content wasn't there. So what I'm going to say is a lot of times people come to us and run ads. And I'm like, well, why? Well, just We need ads. We need visibility. Um, but there's not a clear <laughs> underlying objective. And if you don't have that and you have nothing to measure against, you, you will spend money for the sake of spending money. And you're contributing to the noise. There's no ROI. Google's happy. <laughs> <laughs> so it really, it sounds like it starts with a clear plan and a clear understanding of who you're talking to and what their problems are. What keeps them up at night? What do and they why want? are you talking? Are you trying to create brand awareness? Are you trying to do a direct sale? You know, we will always go back to why. Why are you talking to them? Well, you know, I, I want to be in front of them. Why do you want to be in front of them? You know, really pushing back to get to that root cause, right? to understand like, what is it that you want to accomplish so that we have something to measure against? If you just want to increase brand awareness and you want to increase the number of followers, okay, that I can measure that. 
right? Today you have 300 followers. We do some work and tomorrow you have 400 followers. I can say, look, we just gave you, you know, this type of growth, but we need to understand the underlying why so that we have something to measure against. And that, you know, if you don't have that in your content strategy, you are just spending money. Absolutely. And, just and I think that's what differentiates practitioners. If they're not asking you these questions and they're just doing whatever it is that you ask them to do, I mean, there's a big difference there. But helping you, our job as professionals is to really help people think through the process so that they can have some success. Yeah. And, and our job as professionals is to understand what success means to them. Yes. And to further define that, because for different people, it may mean different things. For some people, success is signing the new client. For some other people, it's a thousand likes. You know, so understanding how do they define success? Um, because I can get them the new client. They're like, oh, I really want brand awareness, <laughs> you know, because I have to go out and get another client. <laughs> You know, I got on the new client, but they didn't, that doesn't create brand awareness or doesn't create get the next client for them. So really clearly understanding like what was that objective so that we are moving towards it and we have something to measure against. Uh, you know, right. Yeah. Sure the KPIs and the content, but we did. So. Yeah, no, the KPIs are, are everything. And, you know, there are different KPIs for different objectives and for different platforms. Um, sure. Do we want to address the KPIs at all? Well, I mean, uh, the KPIs, you know, are tied to whatever your goal is. So if your goal is visibility, so how many people visited your web page, you know, what did they do when they got to your web page? Where did they go? How long did they stay? Did it result in a purchase? Those are all different types of metrics, depending on what you're, you know, are you simply getting them to come to your web page or do you want them, if you are sharing information and awareness, you know, did you want them to go to three or four pages and it shows that they're engaged? How long did they stay on a page? If they stayed on a page for 30 seconds, clearly they didn't bother to read it. So you got the page views, right? So that number is great. But then if you look at the next metric was how long did they stay? They're not, they're not reading your content. They're just, you know, clicking through your website and that's not, you know, that's the next level of information that we're going to look at because we want to know, are they actually reading the content? Then the next step from there is, was there a call to action and did they take it? Did they sign up for the newsletter? Did they, you know, leave a comment below? You know, the next step is what was, you know, the required action that we wanted and did they take it and what percentage took it? And then as we begin to understand these metrics, we can say, okay, 20% of all people that land on our webpage view two or more pages. Of that audience, 20% spend more than a minute per page, right? And then what we can understand as we start to collect these numbers is if I get 100 people come to my webpage, on, on average, two of them ultimately make a purchase. Then what I know is if I want to make 20 purchases, I need 1,000 people to visit my website. Right. So I understand the metrics and I understand the basic conversions. Then what I do is I drive the traffic so that I can, you know, the conversions will result in the number of actual actions that I had wanted. Yeah. When I do KPIs on LinkedIn, I look at similar things. Um, but one of the first things I'm going to look at is, are you reaching the right audience? And there's a couple of ways that I... Uh, and can determine that for people it's search appearances and who is the who is the people who are the people that are are sh searching for you you know are they in the right industry are they at the right level within the organization that sort of thing and then each post has individual um, analytics as well. Who's your number one audience? Who's your number two audience for that? Because there are some audiences that don't engage on LinkedIn with content, but they're looking at it for a significant amount of time. And there are ways to see who is viewing and spending more time on your content. Yeah. I mean, also, you know, I will get a ton of page views, but there are people who are trying to sell to me. So in my mind, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's no value to that. So I'm not looking at the page view because, you know, probably 
two out of every three um, contacts that I get via LinkedIn are trying to sell me something. Right. So those it's... in my mind, like I discount those. Those aren't, you know, those aren't page views. Those aren't, um, you know, opportunities that are people trying to sell me. So, you know, if you solely rely on the one metric of how many people are contacting me, that's not a good metric because, it, you know, I have too many people contacting me that are, you know, that are inbound versus outbound. So, you know, what I want to look at is what do I care about, which is, you know, who are the people that I might ultimately engage with and what does that look like? What does that subset look like? And just ignore the rest because in my mind, those are all noise. Right, right. So yeah, it's not just the metrics, but it's the quality of the metrics. Well, or or making sure that you're measuring the right thing. Right. right. If, you're, if you're simply just me measuring page views, I would argue maybe that's not the right metric to focus on. Um, you know, and what the nice thing about this process is the more that we do it and the more information that we collect, and this kind of goes back to that whole idea of like, you know, revising, you know, circling back, doing it again. A B testing. Right. Is we get as we get better at this and we collect more and more information, we're like, oh, that's not the right metric. This metric should be that. Right. We should focus on this instead because we start to understand our audience better. And therefore, like page views wasn't the right metric for us. What we should be focusing on is, you know, contacts or, you know, some other metric. So a lot of times we will start off looking at one metric. And as the process matures, we it gives us insights to, to say, you know, that's an interesting metric, but it's not the metric we should focus on. We should focus on this over here. So it kind of seems to me that if if somebody is going to commit to a content strategy, they really are also committing to constantly um, revising it, updating it, reviewing it, measuring it. Are, are you saying the world's not static? <laughs> <laughs> I am. Okay. I'm going to make a then bold yes. statement so and say, life no. goes on and things change. So yes, absolutely. Rapidly. Yes. Well, and yeah. LinkedIn just announced last week that they've changed their algorithms yet again. Instead yeah, and, and of I mean, you it know, being a popularity come contest. And go, they fall in and out of favor and you need to adapt. Sometimes your audience was react, you know, it was very, you know, we've had periods of time where like the LinkedIn audience is great and then it drops off and we have to figure out like, do we stay with LinkedIn or do we look for somewhere else? You know, did we need to move it? Those types of things. Um, so, you know, we are very sort of living, you know, process of things evolve, things change, and you need to make sure that you're keeping up with those changes to remain in front of wherever you want to be. Right, right. Well, and TikTok is banned in some states. You know, countries. lots of interest. <laughs> lots countries, of it, so, yeah. Yes. So if you're selling in those places, that's not your platform. Right. Yeah. And, and then, you know, we're starting to see activities that, you know, like limiting, you know, certain things within Florida and those types of things. So, you know, we might look at other audiences um, and equally as important is those uh, places where they're limited. We need to find other avenues because maybe we need to get the information in there and we need to convey that. So we need to find other ways um, around the, you know, the limiting of that information. Right. which is a totally different topic, which we, a path we don't need to go down yet, just yet. Um, so maybe to wrap this up, really understanding for content is, you know, who are, what is your objective? Who is it that you're trying to reach? What is their needs? And how do you resonate with that need, whether it's their language or whether it's identifying through some sort of personalization or customization, a solution that meets that need that resonates with them. Um, so again, what we're trying to understand with content before we, especially in content strategy, is where are they? How do we get to the right person at the right time with the right message? And then I would add, you know, what is the frequency that you can keep up with realistically for, you know, the cadence and how often you're gonna be posting things? If it's once a week, be consistent. Absolutely be consistent. Um, but, you know, if the answer is we, you know, our bandwidth says we can only do it once a month and that's not enough, then you need to figure out another way to do it, whether you outsource it or hire someone like us. Um, because, 
you may be able to do it once a month, but that may not be sufficient to remain top of mind in front of your audience. Exactly. It was awesome discussion. Always. <laughs> um, we look forward to further episodes. And if you like what you're hearing, please put comments below. If there's something that you would like us to discuss, um, mention it below and, and we'll try to incorporate it. But otherwise, keep hanging in there, do your content, figure out who it's for. And we will see you next time on Badass Marketing. Bye, everybody. Bye.